you with me today? Amen. We've got some good things. I believe the Lord is going to help us. We're in this together. Amen. Go with me to, um, we'll look at Proverbs 29 and the 18th verse. We've been talking for the last several weeks, a few months, not weeks, but months. We've been talking about vision around here. And uh, for the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, the power of God's word. We've been talking about the subject of God's word and, and being stirred by God's word. And this scripture in Proverbs 29, 18 has been one of the foundational scriptures we've referred back to many times. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And that's out of the King James. Where, the, where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy is he who keeps the law. And so we've been discussing these things, the importance of vision. So we've been laying some things out, making it clear for us so we can see uh, what the Lord, I believe, is emphasizing at this moment, what he's wanting us to see. Because how many know you can't run with something if you don't know what it is? And so if we're going to move forward and accomplish what God has called us to do, we have to make sure that we're continually keeping this in front of us. And um, so we started talking about the subject, uh, specifics on the subject of God's Word. It's such a massive topic. And really, uh, we could spend weeks and months uh, consecutively talking about the importance of God's Word, all the different aspects, how it fits into our life, and we're not going to do that, uh, but we could. Uh, but I, I do want to continue on this morning. It just had a few things that, that I just couldn't get released to move on uh, to the next uh, area. Now, it was my intention originally, as we're kind of going through some of these topics, uh, we spend a week or two on each one and then kind of move on. But when, when, when there's a, a sense that we need to just pause for a minute and just hover, and just take our time, well, then we need to obey that. And so talking about uh, being stirred by the Word of God, the word stirred is just meaning to be motivated, to be mindful of. Uh, one, one, one translation or one meaning of that word actually means to be lit up, to be on fire, to be stirred. And so, and that's not a, a, a one-time thing. It should be a continual thing that these things that we're going to discuss are are not just one-time events in our Christian yeah, walk yeah, or one-time yeah. uh, events in the vision of our church, but they are things that are continual uh, uh, topics and foundational truths that must stay current, must stay on the surface, must stay vitally important to us. And so that's what we're talking about. So we want to stay stirred up about the Word of God. And so, uh, like I said, we can spend a lot of time, but we're, we're not going to spend a ton, but we want to just wait. And, and if there's some things we need to, to touch on. So I'm going to repeat a few things, but I believe that we'll have some clarity by the end of this. Um, let's just look at a few verses. Um, and uh, we'll go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You can put this up, Jack, in the New King James. It says, all Scripture. Everybody say, all Scripture. And these are things I'm hoping you're listening, and it's my desire, and I believe it's the Lord's desire, that listen today, not just to hear a message, not just to hear words, but to actually see. Remember, vision is to see. It's not just, it's not a just, it's not just a, to see naturally speaking, oh, I can see something, but meaning to see it. Ah, it's an aha moment. Oh, I get it. It so says we're approaching these things, allow the Spirit of God, not just my words, but the Holy Spirit to make these things alive to you. Expect the Lord, expect when you leave that the Lord will cause you and allow you to see things clearly that you've never seen before. That's the difference between information and revelation. Information, you just, okay, I get it, I see it. But revelation means, oh, now I, I see. Okay, now, now I, I get it. Now I, now I understand. It's like when you're learning to drive a car, uh, you, can, you, can, you can see the importance of driving safely, but it's not until you see an accident that you're, or maybe you're involved in one, that you're like, oh, now I see that I need to be careful. I should look both ways before crossing the street, I, before pulling out. I see it now. Well, how I many know it, it, it's, it's better to see something through God's Word versus seeing something because we've made a mistake and, right, right. and had life run over us? But we don't have to worry about that if we're walking in the light of the Word. But it says here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable and is profitable, and is profitable. All Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And you say, well, okay, well, I don't see why is that such a big deal. You want to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
One of the things we always ask the Lord to help us to, is to live our lives with purpose. While we're here, we want to be equipped for every good work. Why? Because we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Amen. And there are things individually he has designed for us in this life that cannot be accomplished in the next, but can only be done now. Individually and as a church, there are things he has designed for us that can only be accomplished in this day. I would, I would say this. There are things this week yeah. that the Lord has designed for you and us that can only be done this week. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if we'll live our life with a daily keeping ourselves stirred up on these things and our focus where it needs to be and relying on the word of God, which is profitable, to so be equipped for these things, then we'll be able to walk these things out because we only get to do this once. I don't know about you, but I'm glad we only have to do this once, right? For the believer, this is as bad as it ever gets. And it's not bad at all when you're living with him. But we're never going to experience the things we experience in this life. We're not, we're not going to re- encounter these things again. But while we're here, let's live with purpose. And so the Word of God equips us to be able to do that. I would dare say the Bible, the Word of God, is valuable. Yes. It is important. And it's necessary. I said it's necessary. This uh, scripture in Psalms 119, you probably know this, these verses 119, this is 129. It says, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The message says, every word you give me is a miracle word. <laughs> I love that. Every word you give me is a miracle word. What does that mean? It 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 is beyond human potential. It's a miracle word. How could I help but obey? I love that. How could I help but obey? Says the entrance, verse 130, says the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. The entrance of your word gives light, illumination, revelation. It helps you see what's going on, right? says that the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Now, you might not like the word simple. The word simple means simple, but it also means the open-minded. It means those who are humble, right? And understanding is something that we need. There's a lot of confusion out there, a lot of different voices out there. What is able to give understanding to the simple is God's word. It's the entrance of his word. It's, It's the word of God becoming real to you. How does it do that? Because it's powerful. It, it, it's, it's a powerful thing. It's, it's a living thing. You know, we had encouraged everybody to spend time every day in a, in a chapter. I'm going to say it again. Every day need to be spending time in the Bible every single day. But not just reading to get through the pages, but reading with the intention to understand, depending on the Holy Spirit to help you see what you need to see, right? That, that's called faith. Approaching the, that's a good idea, right? Approach God with faith. Approach the reading of his word with faith and allow him to speak to you. We had said that in the early church, it was a part of their every day. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It was a part of what they did and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread. They did all of these things, but a part of that was in the, in the, uh, the apostles' doctrine. What is that? The teaching of God's word. They didn't have it written down like we had. They didn't have the New Testament then. It was still being written, but they had the, the original sources. Uh, the men and women themselves who were teaching these things. But it said that they continued steadfastly. And we had said that it carries this idea of an addiction. If you will spend time in God's word, it'll be habit forming in your life. But if you don't spend time in God's word, that habit will never be formed. And in fact, other habits will take the place that this godly habit should have in your life. Right? But it's a matter of your will. It's a choice that you make to spend time in God's word. I've had several people come to me. And just say, Pastor Greg, I want you to know I've done what you've asked. I've, I've spent some more time in the, in the Word of God. I've been reading the Word of God. And, and it's just like you said. I would read and finish my chapter. And then, you know, I just, after a few days of doing this, suddenly, oh, that was, that was really good. Let, let me, let me, I think I can make some time. Let me read another one. And then they finish that and they're like, oh. Now you might say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that, have an addiction. You know, there ought to be, there ought to, there's some addictions out there. We should say, I don't want that, yeah. right? Yeah. If you've seen pictures of the faces of meth, that should make you say, okay, I don't want to try that, right? I mean, right. I don't want to go there. But then there are other addictions or, or habits in our life that we should want to, to, to produce because other things that take the word of God's place won't produce life. They're not inspired by God. They, they don't produce in you an eternal reward, but God's word will. So many have said, hey, I've been doing this. 
and it's been producing. I want to encourage you, spend time in the Word of God. If you're not doing it, spend time in the Word of God every single day. This is something, as your pastor, I'm asking us, let's do this. Make a commitment, not just to me, but to the Lord, to spend time in His Word every single day and see what happens in your life. The entrance of His Word brings light, brings understanding. (laughs) Suddenly things will start making sense to you that have never made sense in the past. That's the way it works. Praise God. So we were asking everybody to do that. In Proverbs chapter 4, in uh, verse 20, it says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. What am I doing? I'm trying to encourage you. There is something in this for you. But it's a decision and a choice that you make. He said, my son, give attention. Who gives the attention? His son, he would have to give the attention. Well, that means we have to give attention. Incline your ear. Who does the inclining? We do. It would be annoying if I just kept barking in your ear all the time. It would. If I, <laughs> Sister Diane, yes, it would. She, she agreed with me. If I showed up at your house every day and started rah, 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 you know, trying to incline, you, you, you would not like that. I wouldn't like it either. You have to incline your own ear. To his sayings, we, we have to make sure we do not let them depart in from our eyes. We say stirred up in these things, and we must keep them in the midst of our heart. Their life to our lives. Their life to our lives. Amen? And so we've been talking about these things. You can go back and listen to them and uh, get some more information. I want to go back to Galatians chapter 5. We read this uh, last week, and um, I want to make sure we, we get through a few things here uh, this morning. Like I said, there's just a few things that we just want to... to round out and make sure that we're, we're, we're driving this home, <laughs> that the Lord is happy. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, I say then, now this is inspired by God. This is God speaking to us. Paul wrote it, but this was God speaking to us. He said, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and those are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The flesh, the appetite of the flesh is never satisfied. When we say the flesh, just human desire, you know what I'm talking about, that thing at, at 1030 at night that calls to you from the kitchen for a big old bowl of ice cream, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? With lots of Hershey syrup and maybe some peanut butter mixed up in it. That thing that, if you've never tried it, it might also be habit forming, but, 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 but when you, the thing that calls to you when you know that you shouldn't be eating the, at this hour, that's called your flesh, right? Yeah. And that your flesh wants to speak up and, and, and show up and raise its ugly head to do all sorts of things that are not good for you. But it says here that we do not do the things that we wish, verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. By the way, there's nothing spiritually wrong with eating ice cream at 1030 at night. Your waistline might not appreciate it, but God... You have to obey the Lord. I'll just say that. I've had the Lord tell me, don't eat that. Okay, yes, sir. So, uh, I mean, no, glutton, gluttony's not good either. But anyway, uh, let's move on, move on, move on, move on. Let's not talk about food because Brother Steve will have to leave the room because um, every message he preaches is about food. But anyway, we're moving on. Uh, verse 19 says, now the works of the flesh are evident. They're, they're very plain. They're very clear. Which are adultery. Uh-oh. Wah, 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 right? You went from ice cream to adultery, Pastor Greg. Oh, you went there. Ah, we went there. We went there. No, the Spirit of God went there, right? So the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. That doesn't mean you're not using dove it just, or, or dial. It just means an unclean life. Lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Whoo, he gave us quite a list. And if the list wasn't long enough, he said, and the like. The other things of this nature that apply. Just I'm throwing it all in there. You know what these things are. Of which I tell you beforehand. So this is the mercy of God, and this is the grace of God, and this is the instruction of his word. We should, this is light coming into our life. This should help us. It does help us. So the which I tell you before, and just as I told you in time past, that those who practice, and the King James says do, and that word practice isn't a do, do practice doesn't mean like something you do, something happens occasionally, but it's a lifestyle. 
It says it's what somebody is identifying themselves with. It's who they are. They're practicing this in their life as, as, a, as a means of habit. So those who um, practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he gave this very clear instruction, very clear words that he said, people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. See, very, very graciously, the Spirit of God tells us very plainly uh, where things are at in life and what's okay and what's not okay. And the fact that, that this idea, well, God is merciful and, and God is kind and he's not really, he doesn't really care about those things. He's not really paying attention to those things because after all, God is forgiving. That is, that is idolatry. And that is also uh, having a God other than the God of the Bible. That's having a God that fits our own desires and that it, that is actually lifting something else above what, who God is and what he actually thinks. And uh, so we need to be aware of these things. God is concerned about this, and, and he wasn't trying to scare us. He's giving us insight. He's telling us the plain facts, the people who practice such things. Notice he was talking to believers when he wrote this, and this is true of believers and believers. People who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I know that goes against the modern grace message that's out there, but can I tell you, the, the, I call it the greasy grace message, which means you can do whatever you want to do. God's already forgiven you. He's cool with it. He loves you. Yes, God loves you. He's given you the means to not live this way, but that message that it doesn't matter is not true because it does not align, align with the Bible. It doesn't align with the Word of God. And so it's important for us that we're making sure we're, we're going back to the Word. It's saying stirred up in our lives. So when things show up, that we are living our life appropriately. Yeah. Uh, there's another verse uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 9 through 11. I'll read it to you. Do you know or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, don't you know this? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, people, that's people who've not made, made Jesus the Lord of your life. Well, they're... There's a difference. We, based on the other verse we just read, there is, there is a practicing unrighteousness that, that can disqualify you. He said, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. He's giving a warning. Do not be deceived. That means for them personally, deception was at the door. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revel, revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He said, don't be deceived. Well, I was washed. I mean, if you go back to some things, if you make a habit of living a life, make it a who you are. Begin practicing things that are, are not scriptural and that the Bible talks specifically against and gives us, well, I don't like that. Why does it have to be this way? It's the way it is. I don't like that I shouldn't eat ice cream at 1030 at night. I don't like that. I would prefer to do that every day. And I have done that more than I would like to admit, right? But I don't like that it's not good for me. But it is. It's the way it is. And so being stirred with God's word is meaning that we're keeping these things in front of us. And when we don't do that, that's when deception gets in. The enemy cannot deceive you if you, and other, otherwise, if, other than you letting him deceive you. The enemy has no ability to deceive you other than what you allow him to, to do in your life. We must keep these things in front of us. Now, I said last week, I said, you know, as a church, we're going to preach the truth. And I know there's this, this Nicolaitan we read in Revelations chapter 2 that where uh, Jesus addressed uh, 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 the church in Pergamum. And he basically said, I this thing I have against you. He was upset with him. He said, you've embraced uh, Baal, you've, the doctrine of Baal. You've embraced the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which is something that I hate. There's a lot of pressure in the world, even today, to, to live this life, to have churches that are Nicolaitan churches. What is that? If they're churches of compromise. That really is not that big a deal. The biggest thing is just love Jesus and say you love the Lord and, and everything's good with you. No, we, we, and we can be like the world. We can live lives that really don't matter in these areas. I know 
the scripture says it, but it's not that big of a deal. Jesus said, I hate that. He didn't just say, I hate it like I hate broccoli. I hate it, I despise that. So we have to know that, that this kind of approach is something that the Lord Jesus despises. He is utterly repulsed by it. And there's a lot of pressure today to have, to, to have Christian lives that are Nicolaitan in, in expression, meaning that they kind of go along to, to get along. They're accepting certain things because it's not that big of a deal. We're forgiven after all. In fact, if we're going to win the world, we have to do these things. That is absolutely not right. It was a doctrine of inclusiveness and a doctrine uh, 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 of compromise, and Jesus hated it. So I said last week, I said, you know, this church has been and always will be a place where we preach the Word of God. Paul says, I said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. We cannot be ashamed of what the Bible says or this gospel of Jesus Christ. Only that is the power of God to salvation. And I said last week, I said, you know, we, we have and will always take a stand. And when I said that uh, this week, I just, the Lord reminded me, well, what do we mean by, by taking a stand? What do we mean by taking a stand? In case you're wondering, what are we to do with these things in a culture, in a world that is running in a direction in opposition of God, what are we to do? Well, we have to take a stand. Part of that is a bold declaration of the truth, knowing the truth and speaking the truth, right? If we're afraid to repeat it, how will people know that they're living dangerous lives if somebody doesn't tell them? When I say, and I'm not talking about going out and just forcing things on people, but I'm talking about being bold to, to, to have an answer, a godly answer, a scriptural answer to the things that are going on, the things that we see and in, in, in the things that are happening, we have to do this. If, you, if you'll remember the account of Jesus when the woman was brought to him, she was caught in the act of adultery. Of course, we know, we have scriptures on it. People who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So they were, this woman was brought to Jesus. Now, she was brought to Jesus not to help her. These were, these were religious people. Religion stinks. I said religion stinks. And these were religious people trying to trick Jesus, trying to trap Jesus. They could care less about this woman, but they brought her to Jesus. Of course, they didn't bring the guy. They just brought her. And, um, you know, so she's caught in adultery, and so what are we going to do here? Of course, you know, Jesus masterfully had wisdom. He, he wrote in the dirt. I would have loved to see what it was that he wrote. You know, he might have written the guy's name that was involved, who probably was in the crowd. Embarrassing, right? And so, um, uh, who knows what he was writing, but um, that was a joke, by the way. Embarrassing. It would have been humiliating, but... Um, uh, he wrote these things, and of course, you know, the one, but he said, whoever is among you without sin, throw the first stone. Basically saying, listen, everybody has, has sinned, you know, and thank God. Aren't you glad God's not just trying to toss rocks at us all the time, right? But part of this message that we're, the standing that we're supposed to do is to how we approach people. He didn't condemn her. She was already condemned. But he said, you know, he, after he said that, who's first among you? Throw the first stone. Probably the guy that was involved in it dropped his rock first. And then everybody else eventually dropped their rocks and walked off. And then finally it was just him and this woman, just the two of them. He said, listen, he said, go and sin no more. He said, where are your accusers? Where, where are the people who are accusing you? He's like, nor do, I, nor do I condemn you. I mean, I'm not looking down on you. I'm not condemning you. But he did say, go and sin no more. See, the way it's being approached in many places today is, where are your accusers? Go on and live your life. Right? It's all cool. That's dangerous. He said, go and sin no longer. When I say we have to, we have to take a stand, we have to call sin, sin, and not apologize for it. In our own personal lives, we have to live lives that recognize what sin is, and call sin, sin. Not in an accusatory way or, or a hateful way, but that was the, the very example of love. They wanted to, punishment and judgment. Jesus extended grace, but he spoke truth at the same time. And so as taking a stand, we've got, as a, as, as a body, as a, we're talking about things that we're, 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 we're doing. We have to be bold to speak the word of God. And in our personal lives, in our church lives, to address things when they're brought up, when the Spirit of God brings something up, but, but not run from them, but embrace. What, I love what God said more than I love what anybody else says. 
I value what God thinks more than what anybody else thinks. And if you can't say that, well, then I would encourage you, have a talk with the Lord, right? Get to know him, have a talk with him. But it's important that we, we speak the truth. Do we refrain from preaching the whole truth of God? Absolutely not. We have to be led by the Spirit of God. That's why we need y'all's prayers. That's why we need you believing God with us and praying with us and, and, and expecting us to hear from the Lord, right? So that the right things can be done. A lot of times things look like they need to be handled a certain way, but there's a right way of doing it. We need to be led by the Spirit of God. And part of that is always, what does the Bible say? But, but how are we going to do this? How are we going to navigate these times? Let me tell you something. People are not our problem. I don't know if I said this last week or not. People are not our problem. I said, people are not our problem. There's this thing today, and unfortunately around a lot of Christians that, well, I just can't believe the way that person lives. Don't, don't, don't fall for that. But for the grace of God, you would be in the same thing. Remember Paul says, as were some of you, right? Meaning what? Don't forget where you've come from. How can you minister love? And love means being truthful. How can you do that without remembering where you've come from? And what the Lord has done for you and what you've been set free from, Right? People are not a problem. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, might, dominion. We, spiritual darkness. Is, and that, that's what blinds people's eyes. They can't see it. We've got to present the truth. But in humility, in love, but being faithful and being honest. It's something that we must do. We talked last week about approaching the word of God with a no apologies or, or uh, let's say uh, being absolute. A better way of saying it, being absolute where God's word is concerned. This is such an important thing. There, there, if the word of God says it, we should just accept it, trust in it, and then be obedient. What are you talking about, Pastor Greg? This is, this is, who, this is how we live successful lives. This is how we live successful lives. You know, we're singing the song this morning, He's Under My Feet. I'm not going to try to sing it. I want to run everybody off. He's Under My Feet. It seems like we need to celebrate the fact that he's under our feet. And we should celebrate the fact that he's under our feet. But a lot of times people go through life and they, they, you, you sing that song, maybe even this morning, and you're trying to sing that song, but you feel like, well, if he's under my feet, why does it look like he's been standing on my head this whole week? Are my, are my feet, am I, am I flipped around? What's going on? Because if he's underneath my feet and I'm head down, then that's, a, that's what it feels like, Right? He can't be under your feet. You can't live a life where the devil is under your feet, un, you know, not, not, not messing with you. Now, the enemy comes to attack. He, he messes with people. That's a part of life, that we, we're going to have to deal with the devil while we're here. But living a defeated life, if we find ourselves always being defeated and never finding success and never walking in the provision of God and the blessing of God and the reality of his word, maybe it's because we're not treating his word that it's true. Maybe we're not treating his word as if it's true. Maybe we're just cherry picking the things we like to believe in and not other things. I'm way out of my order already. In Mark chapter 4, let's, let's look at it. Mark chapter 4. What time is it? All right, good. Mark chapter 4. Remember the verse we read earlier about... Uh, let not these things depart from you. Keep them in the, in the midst of your heart. This is all about choices. You know, really, life comes down to choices, the things that you decide, choices that you make. And the choices you, you make where submission to God's word is concerned is really is going to be exactly what you experience in life. And it'll be exactly what you experience in the life which is to come. It, will, it, it, sets, it sets the tone. The Bible says forever your words are, are settled. His words are settled forever. They're never going to change. But it always comes down to a choice. Here in Mark chapter 4, you have the parable of the sower. You know, Jesus gave the parable of the sower. Then he went on to explain it in the 13th verse, Mark four thirteen. It says, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? He said, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones that go by the wayside where, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word from uh, that word that was sown. And he, Satan comes immediately, I can read, and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. How important is the word of God? Well, you can tell how important it is by how much priority our adversary gives it. 
Things, when you're in battle, things that don't matter, people don't mess with. True. Right? They, 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 they attack and go after the things that matter. Yeah. Medics in World War II, medics were always shot at first. Why? You get rid of the medics, <laughs> then, then, then your opposing army, morale is down and there's no one to help them any longer, right? So you go after what's important first. The, the, the enemy comes to steal the word immediately. So these are ones that are planted by the wayside. They hear the word immediately, receive the gladness, but they've got no root in themselves. They endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation, persecution arises for the word's sake, remember the enemy's trying to come take the word out of their life, immediately they stumble. And he goes on to say all these different ones. Some produce verse 20, but these are the ones that are sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. You know, when you, when you buy a bag of seed, now several years ago, we, 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 our yard, our backyard was very sandy when we bought our house, a lot of sand, almost all sand. And um, uh, uh, we, we bought this house and, you know, you know, like mowing sand all the time. So I wanted to seed the yard. Well, we bought a bunch of grass seed and we put it in. And on the bag, you know, there is a certain percentage of that seed that's viable. And there's some percentage of that seed that's just not viable seed. The seed itself is just not good seed. And you have, I don't know, Dr. John, you can tell me there is a, probably a certain percentage and every company is looking for a certain percentage of viable seed that they sell. And so we kind of accepted that some of this seed, 20 pound bag of seed or whatever it was, that a portion of this seed won't germinate just because it's bad seed. So only a certain part can, can germinate. Do you realize that's not the way the, the word of God works? The word of God, every single word, the seed... The seed of God's word, every seed, there, there's not a bad seed in the bag. There's not a bad seed in the Bible. It, it has the potential to produce 100% of the time for everybody, right? It has a potential. There's no bad seed. So when my yard, you know, didn't do so well, I apparently got a bag with a lot more bad seed than I realized, but that's not the way the word of God works. It always has the potential. Well, what's the difference when a person that has 30, 60, and 100 fold show up in their life? It's not the seed, it's your accepting of it. It's not, it's not the seed itself, it's how, how are you gonna take it? Are you gonna take it at face value and accept it, believe it, Act on it because faith without works is dead. Are you going to do something with it or are you just going to say, I don't like that part. That doesn't fit my lifestyle. It doesn't fit what grandma said. That's not easy on the flesh. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, when you, when you do that, then it's not that the seed isn't good because then people say, well, see, it doesn't work. and It didn't work in my life. And that's not the way it works. It didn't work because you didn't believe it, you didn't accept it, you didn't put your trust in it, you didn't act on it. So, as a church, we have to be people, we want to proclaim the word, but we also want to accept the word of God. Personally, we want to accept the word of God. I know you, but when I read that scripture a minute ago, that people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, I, I'm going to look at that list. Right? I'm going to look at that list. And, and then let the Lord talk to me about the and the like. I'm going to look at that list because it matters to me. It may not matter to you where I go, but it matters a whole lot to me where I go, right? Well, I'm going I'm to do those things. I'm going I'm to pay attention to that. The value you put on God's word makes all the difference in life. And it makes all the difference, it will make all the difference in the life which is to come. Is, is the Word of God. It's our foundation. You know what I would love to have is to have a church, a body of believers, but people are coming in all the time, but the culture of the church is a culture of absolute obedience. Not to the pa pastor, but to what the Word of God says. I'm just going to do what the Word says. I'm just going just gonna, gonna to do what the Word says. Even when I don't understand it, if it says it, I just know it, it knows more than me. God knows more than me, and I'm just going to simply obey. You know, when you look at the parable of, of the, well, not the parable, the story of the rich young ruler, the man that came to Jesus, he came to him and he said, you know, good teacher, what must I do to, to receive eternal life? You know, remember that story? What, what must I do? 
Of course, they called him good teacher. Right there, you can see this man was not submitted. He wasn't approaching Jesus as Lord, as the final say, just as a good teacher. And Jesus, Jesus corrected him. I used, to, I used to wonder, why did he do that? He'd say, why do you call me good? Like, well, what's wrong with being called good, Jesus? I mean, people want to call me good. I wouldn't be upset about him. But he kind of got after the guy. Why do you call me good? He said, nobody's good but God. He's trying to help this guy. You're not just talking to a teacher. You're talking, talking to somebody who has more authority than that. He said, what I must do, I've done all these things. He said, yeah, you've done this. But he said, but this one thing you have, this one thing that you lack. He said, go and sell all. Give to the poor, right? He said, now, now Jesus said that was attached to his eternal life. That's kind of crazy. Well, why was that? Because he had more trust in something else than he did in God. He had something that he was, a life he was living that put something else above God. Now, we know had he done this, God would have blessed him. He'd have been taken care of. He'd have left that transaction with more than he ever had. But he left that, that, that discussion with Jesus, and he was upset about it because he had great possessions. You know, when we, when we don't take God's word at face value and be absolute about it, it opens the door to the enemy in our lives. And when a thief comes in, we don't have the right or the ability to tell that thief what they can or can't take. This was a money issue, but really, on the surface, but really it was a heart issue with this young man. There was more depth to it than just he wouldn't, he wouldn't give. He was putting his trust in something else. See, our, our, our obedience to God's word, it's a choice. Remember, it's a choice that we make. Our obedience to God's word makes all the difference on what we experience in life. You might say, well, this area is not a big area, but it opens the door to deception and it, when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. It can cost you everything. Say, well, that's kind of serious. Are you trying to scare me? No, I want us to be prepared. I want us all to live prepared lives. That's a part of being ready to, to, to meet Jesus, to, to, to make sure that as a church that we're doing this. Hmm. You know, just a, uh, a side note, our obedience to his word and our willingness to approach it and, and treat it as absolutely true and live it out is a direct reflection of how much we love him. Jesus is the word made flesh, right? Read the book of John, John 1. He is the word made flesh. And Jesus also said in John 14, he said, if you love me, what did he say? Keep my commandments. Why is this a big deal? It reflects your heart. Remember I said originally about God's word, it not only reveals the Father, but it reveals you, right? And our, our obedience, our, our approaching his word the right way, it doesn't mean we have to be paranoid about being in disobedience. The Lord will direct us. If your heart is open, he'll direct you. He'll teach you what you need to know. But if we'll approach his word from a standpoint, it's right, I don't, I don't know everything, and I'm just, gonna be, I'm just gonna be honest before God and let him speak to me, and I'm just gonna do what he tells me, that is a direct reflection of how much you love Jesus personally. If you don't love his word and value his word, you don't love Jesus and value Jesus. That's a big statement. But if you don't love and value his word, you don't love and value Jesus. If you don't love, value, and obey the word of God, you are not loving and valuing and obeying Jesus himself personally, the one who was crucified for you. You are actively saying, I don't buy it. I don't appreciate it. I don't regard what you've done. I don't, I don't regard you. That's kind of heavy, but, but that's reality. You know, one of the things that we've always done, this has always been kind of our motto, you know, working with the teenagers all these years, something we've done. We have a, a, a play hard, pray hard kind of mentality. You ever know this? Play hard, pray hard. You know, we, we like to have fun. You know, church ought to be fun. Right? Church should be fun. Nobody wants to go to a place with a bunch of pickle-faced people that are just miserable that they're there. You know, church ought to be fun. We ought to enjoy ourselves. The, the life of God is fun. Yeah. Living a life that's in obedience to him, when your heart is happy, you're happy. You know, it's a good thing. And so we've had the thing, the idea, let's play hard, pray hard. Let's, let's enjoy ourselves. But at the same time, let's take things seriously. And when it's time to have fun, let's have fun. But in the, at the matters, uh, uh, the issues of, of importance in life, let's treat these things very seriously. Yeah. Our obedience to God's word is one of those very serious things. 
right? The old saying, you know, uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Who's ever heard that before? All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Do you know the other saying that goes right on? I didn't even know there was one. All play and no work. (laughs) Does anybody know it? That's it. Anybody know what it is? All play and no work makes Jack a mere toy. So all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, but all play and no work makes Jack a mere toy. A simpleton. Just a joke. So you have to have a balance between the two. You have to have a balance between the two. These things are so important in our life. They make all the difference. You know, uh, what, what if our church had 100% obedience to the knowledge that we have? I mean, all of the people individually, members of our church, 100% obedience to the Word of God. What would our daily personal lives look like? Brad just said it. What would our daily life look like? Take a step back and, and, okay, think about your life. We all have things we're working on. Nobody's condemning anybody. We all have stuff, failures, positives, things eh, that aren't so great. But, but if we walked in 100% obedience, how, what would our life look like? Brother Brad said it. He said, it looked just like Jesus. I said, oh, but they crucified him, Pastor Greg. <laughs> and he inherited a name that's above every other name. Now, God is not expecting that of us. That's not what we're called to do. He doesn't have that vision for us. But he does see for us obedience. It's a submission of our lives. What would your life look like? It looked like Jesus. Jesus didn't struggle. Jesus didn't have problems. Jesus didn't have worries. Jesus wasn't fretting. Jesus didn't have anxiety issues. You know, Jesus didn't have trouble paying his bills. Jesus wasn't sick. Jesus wasn't surrounded by scoundrels. He had one scoundrel in the crowd. But it it wasn't affecting Jesus' everyday life. No, Jesus was blessed. He was happy. He walked in power. If your life's lacking power, maybe it's just lacking consecration. Right? What would our church look like? If we had people that were committed, sold out. In every area of life. How we live, how our conversations, how we treat one another. How we treat our time together, our giving, our sowing, our serving. All of those things that Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do. What would our church look like? Oh, it would be, it would be amazing. It would be amazing. Can, can y'all see that? Now, I, I, I can see it. You know what it looks like to me? It looks a lot like heaven. Because that's exactly what heaven's going to be. That's what heaven looks like. It looks like obedience. It looks like absolute commitment. It looks like no compromise. That's what heaven looks like. Didn't Jesus say, he prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? It means we can be moving in that direction. I just want to encourage you, let's value above everything else the word of God. Let's be a people that we are proclaiming it, but we're more importantly, we're living it. We're doing it. We're putting these things into practice in our life. It's huge. It makes all the difference. It'll make all the difference. 100% obedience. It's possible. Why don't you stand with me? Father, we love you. Hallelujah. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. We're so thankful for what you've given us, made available to us. We recognize you as the answer for humanity. We recognize, we we know, we're thankful that you were the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. You're awesome. 
You're loving, you're kind, you're powerful, you're amazing. But we also recognize, we have, we have, we have the scriptures that you and your word cannot be separated. Your word is amazing. Your word is amazing. These are the words of eternal life. These are the words of salvation, redemption, provision. These are the words, and there is no other. You can just agree with me if this fits you. Father, we make the commitment in ourselves this morning to live lives in line with what you instruct us in your word. Holy Spirit, we ask for your help. Teach us, guide us, direct us. Cause these truths to become alive to us as we incline our ear, as we yield ourselves to it. Have the right heart, have the right attitude, and endeavor to walk these things out. Show us the things to do, how to live our life. Lord, we know your seed, it produces, it always produces. We just have to simply submit ourselves to it. Father, we thank you for it. 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 Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You don't have to listen to me. You can raise your hand and just thank the Lord for his goodness. Thank you. 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 Thank you for your word. Thank you for your help. Thank you for the instruction that you provided. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So make a decision to put my word first. Make a decision to walk in the light that you have. And yes, more light will come. Make a choice to obey at all cost. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will do the very thing that was mentioned before. As you delight yourself in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. But that delighting starts with delighting yourself in my word. And what I've already told you to do, how to live, how to think. So do that, and all the rest will come to pass. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you.